Hello, it's Waylon Chow, and this is Torts, an introduction and intentional torts, module 3A, part A. In this part, we will begin the introduction to torts by looking at what is a tort, the three different types of torts, the legal analysis that you need to apply to torts, and also the, the tort of battery. What is a tort? It's, it's certainly not a cake. A legal tort is made up of three different elements. There has to be some kind of wrongful act committed by a person, and that act causes an injury or loss to another person, which leads to civil liability. So what that means, uh, civil liability, is that the injured person or the person who suffered the loss may sue the person who committed the wrongful act. The, per the person who committed the wrongful act, the, the technical legal term is a tort feeser. Now there is a social purpose for uh, for a tort, which allows someone to make another person liable for their for their loss. It, tort law is meant to discourage people from committing private wrongs by requiring them to compensate and restore the wronged party. So it gives people an incentive to not do you know, uh, these wrongful acts and and to be to be careful in in what they do. Here's a comic strip illustrating the three types of torts. There's intentional torts, where there's some kind of intentional act. The, the comic here illustrates uh, the tort of trespass, which is actually something that we won't cover. Uh, but what, it, what it's showing is that the, the intentional act of kicking the ball, the ball is trespassing on someone else's property. The second, uh, the second drawing here is, uh, is negligence, when someone accidentally or is careless, and, and that careless, carelessness causes uh, an injury to another person. And the third one is strict liability, which uh, could involve an, being attacked uh, by an animal and suing the, the owner of that animal for, for the injury. So again, there are three types of torts. The first type is intentional torts, which is covered in Module 4A of this course. The intentional tort involves an act that was done intentionally, and that act causes harm to someone else. Negligence torts, which is covered in Module 4B, involves an act that was done carelessly or accidentally, and that, that careless or accidental act causes harm to someone else. The third type is strict liability, or strict liability tort. So with a strict liability tort, someone has been harmed, but it's not because something was done intentionally or carelessly. So this type of tort is only in particular special situations, such as the transportation of dangerous products or the keeping of dangerous animals. Uh, we don't cover this type of tort in this course, but if you are interested, please have a look in the textbook. Uh, there is a case brief, case brief 3.1, on page 67 uh, with a case called Cowles versus Balak. So it, it involves uh, a, a couple who were injured uh, by, uh, by animals at the African lion uh, safari. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, one, of the, uh, one, of, one of the people injured was a Sheridan student at that time. To determine whether or not a tort has been committed, we first need to see what the legal requirements are for the specific kind of tort. Every type of tort has a specific you know, list of requirements that have to be met in order to conclude that a, a tort or that tort has been committed. So these legal requirements have been set by, by courts through case law. If the requirements of a tort are met, we then need to look at the applicable defenses that, that may allow the defendant to either avoid liability altogether or to reduce the defendant's liability. So some torts have specific defenses that, that would do that. So for the tort of defamation, there are the defenses of justification, absolute privilege, qualified privilege, and fair comment. So if any of those defenses apply, the defendant, the person being sued, would not be liable for defamation. If, if we conclude that all the requirements of the tort are met and none of the defenses are available, then a tort has been committed. The next thing the court has to determine is, you know, what is the appropriate remedy to give to the plaintiff to, to address the wrong that has been suffered by the plaintiff. 
Let's go back to the case of Betel and Yim, which we looked at way back in, in Module 1. So we had used that case uh, to illustrate you know, how, how we do a proper three-step three -step, uh, legal, legal analysis. So, that, so if you remember, that case uh, involved uh, a variety store owner named Mr. Mr. Yim. And uh, one day, uh, a bunch of boys, including uh, one named Betel, entered his, uh, entered his store. Uh, you know, played on, played with uh, stuff in his store, and then, and then Mr. Yim was irritated with them and asked them to leave. Uh, the boys uh, went outside and started throwing lit matches into the store. So Mr. Yim went after uh, the boys and grabbed one of them, which was uh, which was Betel, who is uh, the plaintiff in this case, and started shaking Betel. And uh, in the process of shaking him, uh, he hits Betel's nose, and, and Betel's nose uh, is is broken. So that's uh, the, the, the injury that's being uh, sued for in this case uh, by Betel is, is the broken nose. So let's, let's look at this case uh, in terms of the tort of battery. Back in module one, we had looked at the, the requirements of the tort of battery, but let's look at it in more, in more detail now. So first, uh, for, for all the torts, or most of the torts that we'll, we'll cover in this, in this module, uh, we will, we will uh, summarize them uh, in three different parts. The first part being the requirements for that tort. The second is the available defenses for that tort. And the third uh, is the, the appropriate remedy if the, the tort has been committed. So for the tort of battery, the, re the requirements are that there has to be an intentional act causing offensive bodily contact and also the defendant has suffered some kind of harm from that, from that contact. And, and what is meant by the word offensive is that the, the, the bodily contact was, was want, unwanted. So even if the contact is harmless or even beneficial, like in the case of uh, a medical treatment, treatment where consent has not been provided, uh, if the contact is unwanted, it is still considered to be, to be battery. So if those requirements are met, the defendant could still be held not liable if one of these defenses is applicable. The first defense is the defense of consent. You know, did, you know, did, the, did the, the plaintiff in some way consent to, to the battery? So you know, the uh, most, most obvious situation where uh, you know, being hit, where you have consented to being hit is where you voluntarily enter into a fight uh, with with another person. So if that other person, you know, hits you in that fight, uh, there is available the the defense of of consent. You've consented to being hit by entering into that into that fight. So you the defendant could not be held liable. The second defense is called is called self defense. So if someone attacks you. Uh, you can use reasonable force in response to an immediate risk. So if someone is right in front of you, they're about to attack you, and, 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 you, and you want to protect yourself, you have the right to use reasonable force. And if you hit them in self-defense, you're not liable. The third, the third defense is called legal authority. So specific people under, you know, un, under legislation or, or even common law, it may have legal authority to use to use force to make bodily contact with another person. Uh, the most obvious example uh, is is police. So if if they if they if they feel that someone has committed a crime, they have a right uh, to use reasonable force to to make to make an arrest. The third or the, rather the fourth uh, defense is called necessity. So that's where the, the bodily contact uh, is justified because of some uh, e emergency, some kind of uh, critical situation where the contact uh, is needed because of that emergency situation. The, the last defense is called provocation. That's only a partial defense. It doesn't remove all or eliminate all of the defendant's liability. So that's, you know, so that's where the, the person has been provoked 
uh, where the words or actions would cause a reasonable person to lose self-control. Um, so if if the plaintiff had had said or done something to provoke the defendant to and which caused the defendant to lose self-control and hit the plaintiff, then you know, then there is the partial defense of of provocation, and the defendant will not be held fully liable uh, for the for the injuries. Now, if the requirements are met and no defenses are available, so that means the defendant is liable, and the court has to decide on an appropriate remedy. In in the case of the tort of battery, the the, the, the usual appropriate uh, remedy is compensatory damages to cover uh, the economic losses that the, that the defendant has suffered due to the injury. Later on in this module, we will cover in greater detail the different types of remedies available uh, in, in tort cases. Let's now do the legal analysis for the Bedell and Yim case. The first step of identifying the legal issue is, is stating the, the legal question, you know, did Yim commit the tort of battery against Bedell? The second step of stating the applicable law. So the first thing we need to set out is the legal test for the tort of battery. Which, which is, you know, battery is committed if the defendant did an intentional act which caused offensive bodily contact on the plaintiff and the plaintiff has been harmed by that contact. The, the second part of the applicable law is setting out the applicable defenses. So I won't, you know, read, read them out, but that's basically putting out in, in full sentence form what the defenses are. And last part of the applicable law is stating what what the appropriate remedies uh, are. So, so what I put here is that if the defendant did commit battery without any applicable defense, the defendant must pay compensatory damages for the injury suffered by the plaintiff. So, let's the third step of the legal analysis for battle yim and yim is applying the law to the facts and coming to a conclusion or opinion. So, we first apply the legal test for the tort of battery to the facts. So Yim did intentionally make bodily contact with Bettle by grabbing and shaking him, and this contact caused the breaking of Bettle's nose, so there was harm caused by the bodily contact. So therefore, the legal test for battery is, is satisfied. The next thing that we do is look, see if any of the defenses are applicable to the facts. So the first defense is uh, the defense of consent. So Bettle did not consent in any way to being grabbed, grabbed by Yim. And since Bettle did not attack Yim, Yim was not acting in self-defense. So the self-defense uh, defense is not available. Yim does not have any special legal authority to grab Bettle. And also, there was not any emergency which necessitated the grabbing of Bettle. So none of those defenses apply. Uh, however, you know, we could say that Bettle provoked Yim by, by throwing lit matches into the store. So, so therefore, a partial defense uh, is available to Yim. So this partial defense would, would act to reduce uh, Mr. Yim's liability for the tort of battery. It won't eliminate his liability, it will only reduce it. The third step of applying the law to the facts is to is to determine the appropriate remedy. So Yim will be liable to pay Bedel compensatory damages for any economic losses he has suffered due to his broken nose. So such, so these economic losses could be things like uh, medical expenses, or or loss of income from missing work due to the injury. So if Bedel had a job that he couldn't do because of his broken nose, he could claim for that for that loss of income in the form of compensatory damages.